Hello and welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network where we dive deep into our Bo's most second work five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we're back for the uh, final non-interlude chapter of Collateral, Collateral 4.12, which picks up with Blake mm-hmm. and Evan on the move, chasing after Hyena, um, trying to capitalise on this meagre advantage that they made for themselves, I guess. Yeah, to be honest, I'm still wrapping my head around how Blake convinced himself that suddenly the hyenas on the back foot Mm -hmm. um i feel like this rhetoric probably has more to do with convincing evan and himself that they've got the (laughs) upper hand than believing it i really like the opening to this chapter it kind of starts with this uh thing about canadians (laughs) measuring things by time which is just a weird little a weird little kind of slice of life thing that then leads into blake is thinking this yeah a little fun fact yeah he's measuring the the size of the park and it's a great way of like Starting out abstract and dialing it back into the situation. Um, yeah, it's, it's strong opening. Well, and I mean, Blake also manages to sneak in a little dig at Americans by saying that <laughs> uh, the more cultured part of America does uh, what Canada does and the less cultured parts of Canada do what the US does. Uh, <laughs> which That's not a dig. That's just a description, <laughs> Elliot. <laughs> I'm not saying yeah. I disagree, uh, but... Yeah, it's um. We can shit on both of them from all the way down here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It's it's great. It's such a like you know, it, it for the web serial format. You don't really spend that much time thinking about how different things have to be when you have to kind of pull the reader back in every three or four days. But this is a great example of how to do it well. It's just kind of like, oh, here's a weird, interesting little opening that perfectly segues into the action again. Yeah, and it's doing things, it's reminding us that Blake is Canadian, um, and this is all happening in Canada, in case you somehow forgot. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, yeah, it's it's good. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, Blake and Evan are running past a bunch of others, uh, trying to basically avoid them as much as possible, um, but he gets uh, kind of set upon by a few, like, fairies that have gone wild, um, and he kind of enters this little fight with them, uh, his glamour getting stripped away and, and the wounds underneath his glamour being much worse than they were when the glamour went on, <laughs> which is to be expected. <laughs> yeah. I-, I wonder if this part of Canada is particularly saturated with fairy or if it's just, mm. if they're like that all over the place, you know, like, is, is it just this area is particularly chockers, uh, yeah. fairy, like, I-, I don't know. It's, they they, see- they do seem to be coming up a lot, um. They, yeah. they seem to be an important uh, presence in this whole sort of province of Canada, at least. Yeah. Uh, there's a fun beat when these fairies are being introduced. Fairies? Fairy? Whatever. Um, when Blake kind of looks at them and almost confuses them for, like, kind of acting savage, which is just mm. so fun. I love I love the fairy as these, like, very method actor others. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, um, but he he sort of says the looks in their eyes tells him that it's well, not acting, and but yes. it's a, uh, it, it's one of those little details that really flesh out stories that are great, like like all the Wildbo stories I've read so far that mm-hmm. you know might be missing from other stories. It's just that yeah, that attention to the detail of the existing world building that, that really sort of shows how rich uh, the world of Pact is. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, it's these kind of little details that really make you understand what the fairy are intrinsically. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so I want to touch on this bit, how the <laughs> how the wounds underneath the glamour are much worse than they were before. <laughs> like, we've been talking for ages about Blake being so over-reliant on glamour and, you know, he knows that it's going to come back to bite him and this is the first moment of us kind of seeing that payoff um, where, like, even his clothes are getting holes in them <laughs> that weren't there before as the glamour comes off yeah uh, i mean i did not see this coming um <laughs> no it, it's interesting so i was under the impression that that was specifically the the fairy that was chasing him or or that was like you know sort of attacking him that was making it like even worse than it would have been like you know we knew that all, all this over reliance on glamour was going to come back to bite him but because this is packed it isn't just the normal like Oh, you know, and then it came back to bite him in the ass. It's like, oh, but anyway, then it also turns out he has to fight Fairy, who are able to, like, manipulate it even further and make things even worse than they should have been. Yeah, it's like a double whammy of reasons why you shouldn't rely on glamour. Um, Yeah, so the Fairy is kind of, like, basically is able to use the glamour to transfer wounds that it has to him. 
uh, mm-hmm. which is great because obviously Fairy know how to use glamour more than you know a, a basically three weeks old practitioner does. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's rough. Uh, yeah, and and I mean this is all sort of. Uh, we we get hints that they're specifically chasing him for the glamour very early on like as soon as they start chasing him he sort of scrapes his face against a branch and and feels the glamour come off and then he notices the fairy sort of pulling at the glamour as it runs past the branch and seemingly getting a little stronger yeah. uh, so like right from the start of the fight you're sort of like oh shit like they're coming oh, for his shit, glamour yeah. <laughs> oh yeah fairies know how to use glamour too yeah yeah uh um, and then I mean I'm going to I'm going to try and be optimistic here and say well now Blake has learned that you can use glamour offensively if someone else is using it like, maybe that'll be something he can do something with well yeah I, don't know. I mean if he ever <laughs> finds anyone who's able to bullshit about glamour as much as he is yeah maybe um so I pulled out this quote here which kind of shows off this great creepy moment as the fairies are talking, but I've realised, you know, I have to read this quote out, and it's in, like, Irish, and I have no <laughs> idea how to pronounce it, so I'm just going to give it my best. Um, Comfroin Liom, the woman rasped. The male fairy didn't respond. Comfroin Lilin, the other male fairy echoed. Um, and I, I Google translated this, of course, as the as the chapter kind of begs you to do, and it's these yeah. fairies speaking in, in Irish saying, share with me, share with us. And it's this great little... I don't know, it's just so fucking creepy that they're, like, feeding on <laughs> Blake's glamour to de-wound to themselves. It, yeah, but it also totally tracks with everything we've heard about uh, the, the hyenas' victims. Yeah. Uh, and because I did the same thing as you. I, the the second I saw this, uh, there, well, there was a brief second where I was like, is this some weird typo? And then I was like, no, this is another <laughs> language. Uh, and so I immediately threw it in Google Translate and... Uh, because obviously Blake doesn't understand it, so I was there like, oh, he's not sharing, like, you got to use that. Mm. And, it, like, Blake doesn't know that, so you get this cool bit of dramatic irony, but it kind of works either way, because either you're on Blake's level and you figure it out with him, or, mm. like, you've Googled it and then you're like, oh, you got to do this, and there's, like, some dramatic irony at play. It's uh, it's cool. Yeah, it's a good point. I, I didn't think about it like that, but it is kind of we get you know, us, the audience who can go alt tab and Google translate this bit of Irish kind of get, get the, get, get what these fairies are kind of arguing about before Blake does. Um, but he, he does yeah, well, when figure you, it out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you hide a mystery behind like a translation thing in, in text, it's, it's pretty common that that can like just break it because if you go and Google it, like there've definitely been other times in books where I've gone and translated something and been like, Oh, this is what this whole mystery is, mm. and and this one it it's because it doesn't really solve it for you. It's like the yeah, clue. It's not, <laughs> it's not like a huge mystery. It's just a little kind of beat of what these fairy are after, and you find out in the next like paragraph or two. Um, yeah, it's ultimately inconsequential. Uh, exactly what they were saying. Uh, it just gives you a hint, and and so it works either way. Yeah, totally. Um, so Blake kind of uh, gets this, uh, and and. <laughs> He, like, goes and sucks some blood off of his hand and spits it onto the fairy, kind of <laughs> using it to feed the, the anger and jealousy connection between them and causing them to kind of fight. And uh, Blake is able to escape, in air quotes, uh, <laughs> as a, a literal fog of others descend upon him. Yeah, and I feel like I've been overusing this term lately, but it's really out of the frying pan into the fire. Like, he, he manages to escape <laughs> these three fairy and... <laughs> yeah. Finds himself totally surrounded by a little horde, uh, and he starts to get worried about like all of them closing in on him. Yeah, uh, rightfully yeah. so. I, I think yeah. "out of the frying pan into the fire" is another kind of subtitle that would apply quite well to Pact as a whole. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Blake kind of is is encroached upon by this ring of others that are surrounding him, and he kind of makes a little play uh, to to get through. He kind of shoots shoots off to the side, and then kind of darts off through this gap in the ring. Um, and almost gets away before he accidentally makes eye contact with an other that forces him to look at it. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's like he, once he makes eye contact with it, he can't turn his head away. Yeah, she really blindsides him with this one. Um, oh, that was a classic. You see what, you see what I did there? Uh, yes. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, what is it with what is it with Wabo and and like things that mess with your line of sight? Because there was um I can't remember the 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 cape from Worm, but there's one who you can't you can't like look at them properly. Then there's blind sight, 
Blindside? Blindside in um, Ward. Now there's hmm. this in Pact. I- I'm sure they appear in every single Wabo story. Yeah, well, and I, I think it's because most people use sight as their like primary sense for mm. like getting information uh and so having that one sort of altered or attacked is mm. like sort of the most scary like because you know doctor who's used it uh as well like it's it's uh mm. it's a it's a good avenue to attack um but i, I like how this yeah, this true. woman uh with the eye contact bit she's not like a ghost or anything she's like she's more of like a bloody mary special case of other who mm. who just is some urban legend, <laughs> but I guess she never got the chance to be the full urban legend she could have been because she ended up under the hyenas. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, and this also, so the connections between people, I guess I was viewing them as more 2D than 3D. Like, mm. the connection literally exists between their two eyes, and that's why he can't sort of break contact with or eye contact with her right like it's uh yeah because he talks yeah. about banging the shotgun against her, uh the connection whereas and i was more like viewing connections thing. yeah yeah i was more viewing connections as sort of 2d lines i guess i don't know i, I guess i just hadn't really put much thought into what exactly they sort of look like to blake but uh i picture them yeah. as um i picture them as like the the chest tubes if you've seen donnie darko where he can there's a point in the movie where he can kind of see the future and see where everyone's going and it manifests to him in these like glowing (laughs) uh like translucent tubes that come out of everybody's chest and point out kind of their path through the world that's how i picture them i don't know unless you've seen donnie darko that probably doesn't make sense yeah i I haven't seen donnie darko i have no idea what you're talking about but i I, yeah i guess i'm for media md (laughs) um (laughs) I guess I, yeah, I am now sort of picturing them, you're right, as, as tubes rather than, I guess, lines. Like, I would, mm. I was almost viewing them as something so abstract that they didn't have a third dimension, whereas this seems to imply mm. that actually they kind of do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, the other thing that I like about this is uh, Blake um, kind of trips over as he's, as he's, like, backing away from this other. And I, at least when I was reading it, I had this moment where I was like, Oh, he's tripped, you know, that'll kind of jolt his line of sight away and he'll be fine. But no, he yeah. actually almost breaks his neck in his <laughs> struggle to, like, keep his head focused on the other. And I'm like, oh, shit, this is a lot worse than I thought. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, that because that's the whole thing, is then later he's, like, falling down holes. And I'm thinking, well, what, happened, what would happen if he just jumped down the hole? Like, would his mm-hmm. eyes pull themselves out of his eye sockets? Or, like, I, mm. I don't know, it, it's... It, it definitely adds this element of, like, oh, shit, to the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but he does uh, break the connection. He is able to throw... He, he kind of, like, throws snow at his... You know, in, into the space in front of him at his eyes a bit. And um, and this kind of gets in the way of the connection. And he quickly kind of turns his head away. Um, and Evan, being his very rescuing Evan self, leads him <laughs> down this kind of small hole and tunnel that allows him to escape from this ring of others. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I love how this whole thing goes down because, like, Blake obviously tripped on something, so he sort of knows that he's on some, like, rough terrain. And mm-hmm. then he just sees these visions of Evan jumping through his stomach and he figures <laughs> out, oh, like, I'm I'm sprawled over the hole. So he, like, yeah. uses defense curl to, to yeah, just sort of he, fall he, like, into it. He, goes in butt first, basically. <laughs> it, it's, it's, um, it's probably not graceful, but uh, it was probably the right call. Mm. Um, yep, uh, just another great example of Evan saving his ass, you know, like, shit, Evan, you're so useful, man. Yeah, uh, and then, so there's this whole scene in this little not-quite-a-cave thing, um, and I love this line where Blake is being chased by some monster sort of through this tight squeeze, and he just Mm. says, fuck, and then he wonders, is it an understatement, uh, sorry, is an understatement like that bad enough to count as a lie? (laughs) Which I just... (laughs) I just thought it was hilarious, and it's it's a, again it's a sign of a great universe when you can make in universe jokes like that. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is just a little. It's just a little joke beat to kind of keep you in the keep you keep you in the zone. I think. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, as Blake is kind of crawling through this quite tight tunnel, his his uh, uh, locket gets caught on something. He's not really sure what gets caught on the edge of the tunnel, um, and so he has to kind of squeeze through, and he can't do it um but what he eventually manages to do is is find a, a jar of something out of his cargo pants and kind of like rub it over the the court area and this lets him kind of squeeze through um but so 
he's talked about having glamour in a like glamour paste in a jar before, but we don't actually ever get get confirmation of what this jar is, right? Yeah, I assumed it was the glamour, but uh, like I did have to assume, yeah. Yeah, I, I assume that too. I actually went back to uh, four point six and four point nine to, uh, to 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 go to the kidding up montage um, <laughs> and, and see what he puts in his pockets. And and the jar isn't mentioned, so I I think we have to assume it's glamour. But I just I I don't know. <laughs> I find it a very funny image if it's just some miscellaneous jar of like jam that Blake has in his cargo pants. He's like, "What have I got? Shit! Oh, this! I'll just spread this on myself." Well, I guess so. He uses it to make himself slippery. Which, yes. like, and, you know, he, he calls it metaphorical butter later. So, mm. if it's not glamour, he must have just had, like, a jar of oil on him, which actually, I guess, you know, holy oil's a thing or whatever. I don't know. Like, maybe that isn't such a ridiculous thing to have on you. Uh, maybe he's just getting better situation. at being prepared. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, Blake and Evan uh, get out of the tunnel. And, uh, yeah, and Evan is Evan is kind of acting more and more stone tape you know he's he's going back to his stone tape form um and he mentions something about conserving energy and this causes blake to kind of click onto what's been going on with rose yeah so before we go any further uh i've just noticed that you've just skipped over this whole claustrophobia nightmare that is the Mm. the tunnel sequence with Mm. like blake being trapped and something ramming behind him like trying to literally break its way through the tunnel um, mm. I found this terrifying. Like, maybe it's because I, I can get a little bit claustrophobic uh, mm. in the right circumstances. Uh, like sometimes I watch videos of people spelunking on YouTube, and like it uh, it terrifies me. Um, I don't know why yeah. I do it. I, I, I would watch <laughs> those videos. I don't know. Yeah, it freaks me out, and and I, I sort of watch them. I don't know in some sort of sadistic, uh, masochistic, uh, self torture. But uh, <laughs> this this did the same thing to me. I was like, I was so uncomfortable imagining Blake stuck here, trying to crawl crawl forward, getting caught on stuff, having to hold mm. his breath to to squeeze through. It's it's terrifying. Mm. Yeah, but you know what's interesting to me about this is obviously Blake has problems with space, right, with his personal space. Um, yeah, but, but that's more to do with people than uh, right. The uh, but standard uh, yeah. claustrophobia, yeah. Yeah, but that's that's what's so interesting to me. I mean, yes, it's to do with people not being up close to him, but you would think that that would translate a bit in a situation like this. But he he seems to kind of keep his cool mostly throughout the whole thing, right? Yeah, well, he because he seemed more concerned about personal space when it was the others all crowding in on him before he fell in the hole yeah. than it was in the hole. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I just found that interesting. Like he he's very much able to keep his cool in what is a definitely quite a, a claustrophobic <laughs> situation. Um, yeah. Anyway, good work on predicting what's been going on with Rose. You got there. Yeah, I got one. I did it. Just chalk it up. Put it on the sheet. <laughs> Success. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, he has been sapping energy from Rose instead of feeding energy to Rose, which is why she has not recovered, I suppose. Well, yeah, and I guess, like, we don't know enough about Poe's, uh, his effect to know how long this could go for. Like, you know, is Rose mm. going to be ready in a month, uh, a day, a week? Like, mm. we don't know. It sort of answers yes. the question, but doesn't answer the important question, which is, <laughs> when is she coming back? Yeah, when <laughs> when's she back? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, Blake and Evan kind of continue on, and, and Blake eventually finds a place where he's happy enough to confront the hyena um, and start setting up a trap. Yeah, and I love how he's just sort of casually chatting to Evan uh, explaining the history of man hunting animals uh, as he's doing it. It's something uh, my favourite show, Stargate, used to do a lot. Uh, and it's mm. something a bit of a sucker for, which is, you know, the hero acting all, like, jovial and casual as they're facing off, like, nightmarish, uh, way out of their <laughs> league beasts. I, I almost suspect that it's a way of just, like, not thinking about it. Just oh, it's, it's just yourself. as much for him as yeah. it is for Evan or anything else. It's... It, yeah, it's just playing pretend and, and acting like you're calm <laughs> to try and convince yourself that you are. Yeah, um, yeah, which is uh, fun. Uh, so Blake sets up this trap, and, and something I like about it is we don't we don't actually know what the trap is. Like, he's he's kind of, like, setting up basically a, a, what we think is a tripwire, right? But it just feels yeah. like, what Blake, this isn't going to work. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I was very much like, I don't understand how a tripwire surrounded by Holly is going to help here. Like, what it, What is this? And to be honest, I still mm. don't understand it. I, I can't really visualize what happened at all. Um, mm. 
all I know is eventually somehow there was a noose type shape and that captured the hyena. And <laughs> if anyone, if anyone can explain it to me, that'd be nice. But I, I don't, I can't visualize it. Someone's got to do an MS Paint drawing for us so we can kind yeah. of see it. See it in some, sort, um, some sort of fan art of the before and the after, I think, would, would be what I'd need. <laughs> a fan art contest, all that. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so the, the hyena kind of arrives uh, and is pacing around it and kind of seeming to be avoiding Blake's trap. Um, it lunges for Evan and Blake shoots it with a shotgun and this kind of pisses it off enough that it lunges for Blake and gets caught in the chain trap that he's rigged, which kind of noose around its neck and uh, and kind of hang it partially off the ground so that it's not able to do much, basically. <laughs> yeah, like it, it it sort of hang. Sorry. Uh, yeah, the noose sort of keeps it kind of off the ground as well, mm. so it can't really charge properly. Yep. Uh, and there's an important bit as Blake is trying to you know help get Evan to stay around and protect him, where he tries to touch Evan and he can't because Evan's a ghost. Mm. And uh, he he remarks to himself that it's a bit weird that he was so willing to touch Evan, and obviously yeah. this comes back later. It was actually when I first read this, I thought, man, it's a shame that Evan's a ghost because like he'd be a shit familiar, but like Blake seems to like him. Uh, yeah. So I, I like one hundred percent to miss dismissed exactly what this line is <laughs> is foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we'll get to that later. Um, yeah. I I like that. Blake sets up a competent trap and it works. Like, I don't know, I, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but Blake has been getting better at the planning stuff this arc, right? And I do mm. kind of feel like maybe he's, now that we know what's going on with Rose, maybe he's, like, sapping Rose's planning abilities into himself? I don't know. I don't know if the energy sapping is at concrete or whether it's just giving him more energy, which is letting his mind work, like, mm, or, sure. or whether it's just, you know, he's having to learn to do it without the training wheels on, the tra- the metaphorical training wheels here being Rose, who constantly had to save his ass. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're reducing her just as much <laughs> as Blake does. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm saying I'm saying she was just his crutch, um, and mm. you know, letting him be free a bit might have been helping. So it's hard to know how much to attribute just to him, and and how much to attribute to him leeching from her. But he, you're right, he has been doing a lot, uh, a lot better himself this arc. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he's he's actually he's very he seems very competent, which I I like him getting more competent. It's nice. Um, yeah. Anyway, and so then the hyena's sort of trapped here, and Blake tries to bluff it a bit. Uh, <laughs> By yeah. he, he so he calls out the hyena uh, for not actually sort of having control of the others in the area. The the others are sort of either so mindless that they'll attack completely indiscriminate indiscriminately, or they hate the hyena for what it, it did to them. So they will attack it given the opportunity. So yeah, he, and he he sort of you know says, well, if you you know, I'm going to call them all to kill you if you don't uh, submit. Yeah, and. I mean, it seems to work. I mean, the hyena, like, seems to respond to this, and Blake kind of goes off to to summon some of these others, <laughs> just kind of leaving the hyena there unattended, and then he, you know, almost immediately the hyena tries to escape and almost escapes, and Blake kind of has to sc- scurry back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's very comedic. Like, you can totally see this thing where he's he's done his big speech, and then he's, like, walking off all triumphantly, or, you know, he's trying to do his power play, and then he hears a crunch, and he's just like, oh, shit, and he has to, yeah, scurry. Scurry is the perfect word for what he yeah. would have had to do. And then he's like throwing holly all over the place. Uh, and there's this line he <laughs> says uh, where he's just, uh, I'm just going to read the whole line. He's a like, uh, fucker. I said, fuck you, you fucker. Mm. Uh, which is a really good indicator of where Blake is right now. Um, yeah. Mentally, a totally fair place to be, but uh, <laughs> not a good place. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, he's, he's, he's clearly sliding further and further down. Um, but, you know, Blake dashes his holly around and the hyena is properly secured and it basically realises the trouble that it's in and submits um, and turns into a big old sword. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, da, 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 da. Woo, number two. Uh, so I, I want to read out the quote of, of the hyena submitting because I, I think it's great. Um, he spoke a language I couldn't understand, something guttural with more sense in the silences than in the utterances. It was, I suspected, a language so basic that most could understand it. I submit. Uh, this is so Ooh, cool. Chills. Uh, I love it. Yeah. 
the concept of a language that is just sort of so basic you just kind of get it and i think the detail that really makes it is where the sense is in the silences more than the sounds which mm. is is very sort of counterintuitive to most languages mm. uh it's yeah it's it's a great little uh line yeah um yeah and so the <laughs> blake's you know got his got his second uh magic item that he has to give over to conquest he had the imp book and now he got the goblin sword um, which is all jagged and weird it's it's, <laughs> it's great yeah it was a very begrudging uh submission mm. so i guess I- i'm assuming since the hyena just immediately jumped into sword form without any sort of negotiation or contract writing up that did we know that if the hyena had been bound already because i'm assuming that's what this means like it was already mm. under the contract of solomon or, or whatever it is uh because it, it you know it all just happens so fast compared to uh pose where we had a whole chapter uh going over his contract negotiations uh yeah. the hyena the hyena must have already been under something because it just immediately drops into sword form yeah i i'm not sure if this is meant to indicate that it's already been bound i i just think I just think it's like <laughs> it submits and you know when when another submits like that it just kind of puts itself into a simpler form I guess uh, and and for the hyena it picks a form that is you know as much of a fuck you as possible turning into a sword <laughs> where like the hilt has like spikes on it if you hold it wrong and yeah it's, it's yeah, like I, I, not, yeah it's, it's all fucked up and there's even this detail like it, it's still wrapped in the chain as it, as it's in sword form and blake keeps it that way like he keeps it wrapped up in the chain because he's not convinced that if he unwraps it it's just gonna uh explode out which kind of makes sense because he's trying to give it to conquest in probably the least stable form he can while still yeah. being technically bound so this this would yeah. probably fit that bill yeah totally i mean i wouldn't <laughs> i don't know I, I i wouldn't trust it enough to take off the chain given how reluctant of a binding that seemingly was oh not at all yeah um, so Blake leaves the forest, leaves Evan, and uh, kind of calls up uh, one of the knights who then <laughs> somehow get him to Fell, and Fell takes him to Conquest's house, um, which has changed. Now there's a big old tower. Uh, so Blake climbs this big tower, and at the top is Conquest and Rose and the Goblin Book, and Rose is still comatose, and Blake kind of sees the connections between him and her, and this confirms his suspicions. These connections are kind of warped enough that he... He kind of realizes, oh shit, I'm draining her. Yeah. So there's an interesting bit before we go back to some of the Rose stuff, where mm-hmm. Blake points out that in Conquest's new tower, um, there's well, first of all, there's like an obnoxious amount of stairs, which I just think is so <laughs> yep. Conquest. Like he, he has to walk up this unnecessary flight of stairs, uh, and this whole domain is just, and that's domain with an O, uh, mm-hmm. is is sort of constantly transforming and and seemingly getting worse like mm. uh conquest is in monster form yep. uh now as he's presumably leading up to whatever his big play is that we're hypothesizing is is his plan yeah yeah i mean he's getting he's getting more and more monstrous every time we see him right um yeah this time no beetles uh but there are some fish swimming around the uh the kind of the border of the top of this tower and we'll we'll get back to that later um yeah so blake hands over the hands over the the sword and and asks conquest for a phone i'm curious what <laughs> you think his plans for that phone are elliot um yeah okay so hold on i'll come back to the phone but uh one thing that, in, that i did pick up on is blake sort of as he's describing the area and the silver fish and all that he mentions that there are five points of interest around the tower aside from conquest mm. and then he only describes four he says rose is one of them and then he says there's the three altars and he sort of leaves the fifth one unspoken for uh which is interesting i i wonder if it's maybe matching rose's one and it's his spot mm. um yeah but anyway, so- fell fell's there too right yeah, well, I wouldn't consider Fell a uh, point of interest as much as just a guy who's there. That's, I, I that's was more because <laughs> Rose is up on some big altar or something. I was more thinking of mm. like altars and she's chained there. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so now back to Blake. Uh, I, so I mean, he gets this phone from Fell, and I thought he just uses it there to look up uh, Evan's backstory and you know to help him uh, you know make contact with Evan. Like I, I actually was under the now- assumption he gave it right back. Uh, I didn't think he, he was does- keeping it. <laughs> He does look up, you know, he, he searches, he finds a map, but he never gives the phone back, or at least not that we see, so well, I reckon yeah. he's got plans for that phone. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I, like, it's it's definitely, 
not addressed. It goes from like he looks up the map and then we almost instantly cut to him in the in the forest. So there's there's yeah. details missing there. Yeah. Mm, I don't know. I wouldn't if if it's not confirmed on on text that he gives the phone back, I reckon he's got plans for it. Anyway, we'll see. <laughs> um so he 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 gives the sword back to conquest and heads back to the woods uh and finds Evan again um and leads Evan through the woods to what we eventually realize is where his body is um kind of buried in a little not buried just kind of in a little hovel that Evan had kind of crawled into before he died of of cold um and mm. Evan realizes that he's dead yeah uh and that's been a recurring thing over the last two chapters is Evan referring to himself or his ideas for escape in the present mm. uh i i like before he even finds evan blake sort of appreciates the the calm of the area uh you know there was even a bit when he first binds uh the the hyena the sun literally sort of comes out at that point <laughs> like the hyena yeah. was having such an effect on the area the sunlight was diminished uh and it, yeah so I, I really like this bit where he's just sort of appreciating the calm you know taking the opportunity uh and then he thinks about whether he's succeeding without rose but because of her energy if that means that it's even okay and is he doing good or is he doing the right thing like he's yeah has a bit a, of an existential crisis yeah there's a there's a bit where he kind of realizes hey look this place has tangibly gotten better since i took away the hyena like and he Actually, I'm going to read out the quote here, which I like. He, he, he thinks, It was as if a deep-seated worry had less of a hold on me. I could do good. I would do good. Like, shit, yeah, Blake, you can you can go around binding all these crazy shit and just making the world a better place. Why not? Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, but now Conquest has the hyena, so... <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, sure. I, mean, <laughs> I guess you're not doing good if you, if you bind the hyena and give it straight um. to Conquest. No, but it's it's definitely this moment where he can just see that he's not just totally fucking everything up that he touches, which was very much the vibe uh, we were yeah. left with after Pose, because uh, he Pose made that literally the case. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, so uh, Evan, I don't know. Uh, Evan sees his body and and kind of starts crying, um, realizing that he's dead. I don't know. He's a little kid. This is sad. I don't, it's I don't know. I, I don't like it. Yeah, there's I, I don't, there's not much to add there. It's, it's just tragic. It's, yeah. it's it's really sad. Um, so Blake has seen how useful Evan is over the course of of, of fighting the hyena, and seen how kind of lost Evan is as well. Um, and offers to make him his familiar to let him, you know, be more alive again. Yeah, it's um, you know, Blake's logic here kind of makes sense. They, he, you know, he Evan reminds him of himself, which like I, I see. Uh, there's that sort of lostness and aloneness uh, that they both, well, that Blake went through something similar. Mm. Uh, yeah, like, as I said, I did already think earlier in the chapter, it was like, oh, these two might be a good fit for each other. It's just a shame he's a ghost. But it, here we sort of learn that he's he's a little bit more than that because somehow the hyena did a barbatorum and cut off his access to the afterlife. So it's like his whole yeah. soul. <laughs> he's not just a ghost. Yeah, the, the hyena scared off whatever's meant to take him to the afterlife, which is kind of terrifying. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But but there's Blake... also a bit where mm. so there's also a bit where Evan asks like what a familiar is after Blake first offers him, and Blake gives him probably the least useful answer of all time. Mm. And yeah. I have to assume that's because Blake knows as little about this like as we do. Like it, I couldn't have given a better answer than Blake did because I don't know anywhere near enough about familiars and how they work. And it well, got me thinking Blake probably doesn't really either, so he can't answer it as completely as he probably should. Uh, when yeah. he's making offers like this. <laughs> I think that the analogy that he has probably heard is that it's similar to marriage, and I don't think he wants to bring that one out. <laughs> no, yeah, no. <laughs> it's um, not, not a good point to bring up in this circumstance, absolutely. Yeah, Blake Blake has kind of surmised that, or, or knows and, and tells Evan that, you know, he doesn't have to join him, but if he does, it will at least let him kind of be more alive. He'll, he'll kind of feed from Blake, and, and he'll be able to kind of be himself again to an extent um but yeah well we've been told becoming a familiar is a bit like getting a chance at mortal life for others so it's a perfect fit for a ghost that's kind of stuck on this plane of existence yeah sort of become mortal again yeah i I like i like that blake isn't doesn't force him into it though i mean he's like you know he's he's very clearly like you don't have to do this if you don't i'll try and help you anyway (laughs) like Mm. it's very yeah it's very nice to ghosts blake 
Yeah, well, it's 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 definitely the right thing to do when you when you're talking about starting a, a long term relationship with anyone. It's uh, you know the the whole no pressure, just sort of being frank and honest. It's it's definitely the mature play, and uh, and that's sort of what we see yeah. here. Mm. Speaking of mature plays, uh, last chapter, Elliot, if I remember correctly, <laughs> you said that Blake would never take a familiar without at least consulting Rose. Yeah, uh, I so want to say I'm disappointed yeah. in myself, but I'm more disappointed in Blake. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Look, you yeah, can't um, get all your predictions right. <laughs> I don't even think I locked that in as a prediction. It was more of yeah. like a funny hypothetical, like this could surely never happen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You shouldn't you shouldn't put anything <laughs> past Blake in terms of not considering Rose. I mean, if this goes through before Rose is awake, I'm actually very interested to see her reaction to mm-hmm. to this. It's gonna be hilarious, uh, in in a terrible terrible way um yeah so uh blake kind of is putting this proposition to evan you know help me move faster show me escape routes we can work together take it take down the bad stuff and Mm -hmm. evan nods and before he answers lights flicker on and it's the police and evan is uh (laughs) blake is standing over a a missing boy's corpse uh shit I had such a good laugh when I read this. Uh, <laughs> just, just as things were going well, uh, it seemed like we were going to end the the arc on on a high note after like what was such a rough arc, and it's just and it start it started on a high note. Uh, the arc as well, four point one was that original uh, party scene at Blake's apartment, but uh, no such luck mm-hmm. here. Uh, I, I have to imagine this is Laird. Like, this would be Laird's big play, uh, and we, we've already talked about how when that comes, mm-hmm. if it attacks Blake's personal life that'll hit that rule of three thing and it'll be really powerful and i'd say uh, implicating him in another missing persons uh slash murder case uh will will hit that beat quite nicely so i'm very worried for how this is going to shape out and how blake's going to balance being presumably a person of interest in two murders with uh trying to fulfill conquest requests in the next 24 hours it's it's gonna be a busy day yeah how how long is it legal to hold people for in 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 you know for questioning twenty four hours? Is that right? Uh, I mean, in the movies at least, yeah. I, I don't know if Canada's different to America, and I don't even know if America is actually like that in real life. So <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. But yeah, this this definitely seems to be setting up a uh, a big enough problem to Blake's third yeah. uh, trial. Yeah, I just suppose. as he was getting some momentum. Um, so that's the end of Collateral, uh, more or less. We've got an interlude uh, next week that we'll get into, but that's the end of the numbered arcs, the numbered chapters at least. Yeah, uh, and so for our bonus bit, we'll come back to briefly uh, Conquest's new silver fishy friends. Uh, and We've got to continue the trend of examining what Conquest's animals <laughs> yeah. are. Yeah, well, and luckily this will probably be a short one because this is already a very long episode because uh, it was a long and diverse chapter. Mm. Um so I'm I'm fairly certain that these are silver carp, uh, the the silver fish, um, also called Asian carp, because uh, they're a big mm. deal in North America, because uh, they were introduced to help like some fish farms keep algae levels down, uh, and then yep. they escaped, and now they're of a course. massive invasive Introduce species. Species, perfect. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a it's a it's a classic invasive species story. Always goes well. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so, you know, they're, they're sort of beating the the native carp out of their territory and all that sort of thing. <laughs> um, interestingly, they're actually endangered in their own natural habitat because, you know, mm. China is just sort of obliterating its own uh, natural water supplies. Um, yeah. So I don't think that has anything to do with conquest. Like, there's no pattern uh, in the current three animals about whether their original state has anything to do with mm. his power or anything. I just thought it was a fun fact. Um, mm. And speaking of fun silver carp facts, um, they're also sometimes called flying carp because when they're startled by something like a boat's motor, uh, one of their instincts is to just jump out into the air and so they can jump, like, <laughs> over a meter into the air. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, That's a good v- image, yeah. Yeah, well, so they're actually like a hazard. Like uh, people who are in uncovered boats are actually quite often injured by them because the, the carp jumps out and then, you know, the boat goes where the carp just jumped and they get whacked in the face. Um, oh, okay. I don't know how this is going to translate on this audio medium, but I'm thinking of this gif where a, a fisherman in a boat is kind of going along a river and this giant fish just kind of jumps out and slaps him on the face and then like it goes back into the water, like jumps across the boat and hits him in the face with his tail. 
Maybe it's the same species. I don't know. Maybe yeah, it, it could be. I, I think I remember that gif, but I, I can't remember what the um the color of the fish was in that. I actually have a mm. friend who got hit by a stingray. He was on a boat, and the stingray jumped out over the boat and whacked him. Um, but yeah, there's I didn't actually even know stingrays could jump. Jesus. Yeah, they just, they jump out of the water, and it's it's basically the same thing except stingrays are bigger. Um, mm. But yeah, like so, the silver carp have actually led to water skiing being banned in like huge chunks of of uh, rivers and and some lakes because basically with the boat going pulling the water skier, all the carp jump up, and it's like a major hazard for the water skier because they just get absolutely smashed by you know these thirty pound carp that are just out in the wa- out in the air. Uh, which is just a hilarious image. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Jesus. Um, actually, speaking of hilarious images, I've looked up this fish slapping gif. <laughs> it, it is. It, it. I mean, the fish does look quite silvery. I don't know, and the guy looks like he's American. So I'm going to headcanon that and say this is where the idea for conquest having these fish came from. Is <laughs> conquest saw that gif and was like, "Oh, I got to get me some of those." <laughs> yeah, conquest is such a memer. Um, <laughs> I mean, memes are the ultimate example of internet <laughs> conquest. Like, yeah, that's right? true. Like, they're they're the equivalent of an online invasive species. Totally saturating an online community with a with one overused meme is really good for conquest. <laughs> um, um, yeah, but yeah. Anyway, so, so I, I I guess the only trend we've got so far is conquest's invasive species are getting bigger and badder. Uh, yeah, I think that's awesome. Like. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that these invasive species that he just has around are getting worse and worse. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, um, it doesn't bode well for future chapters, though, does it? No, but what does? Honestly, mm, that's true. Um, well, speaking of future chapters, uh, that's the end of this chapter. But our next future chapter, four point X, will be coming out on Friday, the fifth of April. Yeah. Yes, uh, and so until then, you can find us and everyone else who likes to comment on our Deep Impact episodes in the discussion thread linked below. Mm. Uh, we should give a shout out to Kayaken, who has been uh, like logging all of the discussion threads for every episode that we've done. So if you ever want to check out, hey, what did what did people say about damages two point whatever? Um, you can do that. Uh, yeah. If you look in the episode description for our episodes, we have a link to his index of discussion threads. Yeah, I've actually been using those to go and find bits and pieces from our previous episodes. And I imagine if you're you know, not listening to this live and you're playing catch up, it's a very useful resource. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, for more Deep Impact related resources, you can check out our website, uh, doofmedia.com, where you can see our show and all the other great shows on the Doof Network. Yes, and there's a new calendar page on that website uh, now as well, so you can see when all of our episodes and all the other shows' episodes are scheduled to air. Yep, so if you've already forgotten when 4.x is going to come out, because even though we only said it 30 (laughs) seconds ago, check out that calendar page, and uh, yeah, you'll be good to go. Uh, Yes, and so speaking of Doof, uh, don't forget to head over to the Doof Patreon, patreon.com slash doofmedia. Uh, All of that money really helps out this show and all the other shows on the network. Yep, um, and while you're on Patreon, you should check out Wildbo's Patreon, uh, well, patreon.com slash Wildbo. If we give him money, he will write more good things, so do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, you can check us out uh, directly on Twitter at MediaMD Podcast. Ah, actually, speaking of MediaMD Podcast, <laughs> the other show that we do, um, we have a new episode of that, which has just come out yesterday, uh, yep. where we're talking about Game of Thrones. I had never seen Game of Thrones, and you made me watch it, uh, and uh, we talk about the whole first season and what I thought of it. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think it went well, but I'm I'm definitely looking forward to a hopeful follow-up once you've got through more as well. <laughs> once I've got through the other 40 seasons or whatever the hell they're <laughs> up to now. Um, if you want to know what we're talking about, go and check out Media MD uh, from our Twitter or whatever. <laughs> You'll find it. <laughs> yeah. So apart from um, that, we'll see everyone on Friday the 5th for 4.x. Yep, see you then.